You are listening to This is Oklahoma, hosted by Mike Hearn, telling stories of Oklahomans and those that have made it their home. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma podcast. Mike Hearn here, your host, back with another episode. Excited to share this episode with you today. But before we do, I've got to thank our sponsors. First of all, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. They've been a huge part of this podcast for the last few years. So the Oklahoma Hall of Fame have been sharing an Oklahoma story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahomahof.com. And for daily updates, go to Oklahoma HOF on Instagram and give them a follow. Our other sponsor today is the Chicksaw Nation. Now, the Chicksaw Nation have sponsored pretty much everything in Oklahoma. They're a huge supporter of Oklahoma. And it's an honor to have their name and their brand supporting this podcast. So a huge shout out to Governor Anatoby for supporting this podcast. It really means a lot. Our third sponsor is Diffie Ford Lincoln down in El Reno. Now, this one makes me so happy because these guys are great friends of mine, um, play a lot of golf together. I've bought my cars from them. Do most of my oil changes down there, have a cup of coffee, hang out down in El Reno. It's a good spot to go. And not only are they great friends, but they provide a great service. So for over 60 years, a third generation family owned Oklahoma business down in El Reno. They're also in Bethany as well. So people in the Bethany area know the Diffies really well. But if you're looking for anything new used, um, Ford, Lincoln, or whatever, I'm sure they could find anything you want. Um, check them out, DiffieFord.net, and then on Instagram at DiffieFordLincoln. And now, let's get into today's episode. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Zorro, I guess, is the best way to put it, which we'll find that context. Um, but for those listening, you'll see who is who my guest is today by reading the title. So um, thank you so much for inviting us into this incredible office. Uh, I can't wait to take a little tour uh, and check this place out uh, and just hear more about your story. But first of all, congratulations on being inducted last year into the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. No, that was really exciting. And it's hard work, too. Is it really? Oh, it really is. They they put you through. You've got to do 50 photographs, and they want as much detail as possible. <laughs> you've got to assemble a list of invitees. Oh, it, is diff- it is hard work, and they have deadlines. Oh, really? <laughs> and they mean it. <laughs> uh, and I think I've said this on the podcast before, but a lot of people don't realize that you know, uh, a family member can't basically, and you can't, you can't uh, apply for yourself. Someone has to apply on your behalf and they can't tell you about it. And it's super secretive. And then, so it's a real surprise when you find out, but also if someone has, has tried to get you in there before or put you forward for it, you never know if you failed or passed. Obviously, you know, you, you were inducted last year. I guess we'll start with, I mean, how was that phone call and how did you find out? They called me. The, the president called me and Shannon called, and they were more excited than I was, I think. They were just bouncing off the walls. But it gives you goosebumps. Yeah. I think that's the re- I, I still sort of get goosebumps about that. Yeah, I, I, and I think when you see the people you're on stage with on that day or that evening, um, and the other people then that are in the Hall of Fame, like it, it really kind of brings it, you know, to, to, to the the highlight, right? Because the, the amount of people who've inducted, the impact those people have, it's, you know, the class that you were in last year, there's, you know, yourself, obviously a massive impact. And then you're around these, these Oklahoma superstars as well. And you actually bond with your class, with certain members. I'd known Harvey Pratt forever. I was at his induction as a peace chief of the Cheyenne Arapaho. And that's a really, that was a really amazing time. My grandson, Jay, was six years old then, and Harvey had said that once they finished the ceremony and the teepee, that Jay could come in and meet the chief and shake hands with the chiefs. And so we waited outside with Nathan Hart, his, his son, until they finished, and they rolled up the sides of the teepee. And Lawrence Hart, one of the four principal chiefs of the Cheyenne Arapaho, said to his son Nathan, Nathan, bring the baby into the teepee. And Jay said, no! Lawrence said, Nathan, bring the baby into the teepee. And Jay said, no! And then Lawrence, Lawrence broke the sound barrier as a Marine and was made a chief of the Cheyenne Arapaho on the same day. Had a wonderful man. But Lawrence said in that Marine voice, Nathan, bring the baby into the teepee, and they both just walked right in. 
Yeah, it's uh, you have a huge. I mean, you were honored and welcomed into the, the, the Cheyenne Arapaho tribe. Yes, too, I was right? adopted on Labor Day, nineteen eighty four. Yeah, when I was in, when I was uh, named to the court, there was a newspaper article by Charles Jones, and he asked me questions. It was I thought it was a really good interview, but I, he said, "What was your childhood dream?" And I said, "I always wanted to be an Indian." And one summer, well, in the summertime, I would always go down to the powwow grounds, and they were still, the drums were still playing at night, and my mother would retrieve me. And when I was adopted into the Cheyenne Arapaho, we had a dance, and you give away things to honor people that have honored you. And so after it was over, I went over to her and said, well, what do you think? And she said, well, you still haven't learned how to dance. And it was and it was because she retrieved me all the time that I didn't ever learn how to dance. Yeah. Where, where does that, I guess, kind of... Anyway, the day that I was, that, that my, my uh, announcement was made in the paper, I got a call from uh, Chief Big Snake in the Native American Center, and he said... The phone is ringing off the wall. Everyone says they want to adopt you, but I've told them that because you grew up with the Cheyenne Arapaho, that you belong to them. And I did, and yeah. I do. Well, so growing up then, going to the powwows and stuff, what, is that just something that was around your hometown growing up? You were very aware of it, and it was... Oh, yes, Colony is the oldest town in western Oklahoma. Okay. It's been there within four or five miles of downtown Colony is an archaeological site that's been there since the year 1000 or 1200. So the tribes have always been, it's a Caddoan site and not a Cheyenne Arapaho site. Okay. In fact, my friend Jerry Redcorn, and I hope she gets inducted to the Hall of Fame because she deserves it. She is an incredible potter who grew up on that archeological site, picking up pottery shards out of the cotton patch. Yeah. And, and Colony was, established by John Seeger for the Cheyenne Arapaho for a vocational trade school when the federal government decided they'd just round up people and turn them into farmers. The Indian agent wrote a letter said he think it would he thought it would take about five years. Mm -hmm. Really. But Colony was a part of the Cheyenne Territory and they had the run in 1892. And then John Seeger had already been there. He said when he saw at the top of the hill down to Cobb Creek that he had seen the promised land. We just call it the center of the universe, a colony. But that was, a, my, my daddy's mother died when he was six months old. And my great grandfather hired the Cheyenne women to be his nannies. And I have a great picture of him with Howling Man Woman, this little blonde boy being held by her. And so he, my daddy had such great affection for those women and for, and for the tribe. Uh -huh. And during World War II, or at the end of World War II, when they came back, they had a powwow to honor the veterans. And daddy danced in with them. And I'm sitting on the front row on these just kind of wooden benches with these women. And they, they were so proud of daddy. And they looked at him and they said, oh, look at Johnny. He can still dance. And he could. I can't. Yeah, that's, I mean, to see that, right? To grow up and see that and have that experience at such an early age and then be mm -hmm. welcomed in as well. I mean, that's that's a huge honor. I mean, it's... When we were dancing in Red Earth in one of the first Red Earths, Barbara Poe was in charge of the parade and some other things. She's no longer with us, but again, I can't dance. And I, I, <laughs> we're, we're dancing in and, you know, with the, the dignitaries. And I said, you know, I, I want to stand by you because, you know, I can't dance. And she said, we don't care that you can't dance or that your feet in, aren't in the right spot. Your heart is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've taken some comfort from that. Right. Yeah, there, there's more, I guess, respect from them in where your heart is, not where how good you are with your feet and how good you are at dancing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so growing up then, what was what was the dream of you growing up? What did you want to be when you when you grew up? Well, when I got to be a little older, I wanted to be a lawyer. Okay. But 
At that time, the only lawyers I knew that were women were Portia, who was facing life on a radio program on one of the soaps, mm -hmm. or Deborah, who was a judge in the Bible. But I, I, I wanted to do that as I grew up on a, on a cotton farm. I'm a cotton pick and cotton chopper. And as Emil Greaser, who was my representative when I was appointed to the court, said that the cotton patch had done more for education than any other single thing in the state of Oklahoma, because you do want to get out of it. So when I got my driver's license, one of my mother's friends was a lawyer in Cordell. And his wife was his paralegal. She was his secretary in those days, but now we're paralegals and administrative assistants. Mm -hmm. So she wanted to take the time off during cotton picking vacation, which was no vacation, but you turn out school to go pick cotton. Well, I'd been moving the trailer and helping the women empty the sacks and he asked if I would come and give his wife a little relief because I had taken shorthand. And I said, oh, yes. So I, dro I drove to Cordell and worked as a secretary that summer and met the lawyer down the hall who became my career planner. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, you ought to just be a lawyer. Well, I liked that idea. But I needed a way to pay for it. And so that's because I was a med tech before I was a lawyer, MTASCP, did my internship at St. Anthony Hospital. And then after I graduated from law school, four years of night law school at OCU, JT Bailey said to me, well, I'm really proud of you, but you, you ought to get one of those jobs out at the Supreme Court. You ought to be one of those staff lawyers out there. Well, I met Justice Hodges at my first year in law school at a party that OCU threw at the Beacon Club for some of the, the class and for the justices of the court. And I met Justice Hodges, and we later became really good friends with the family. And two and a half years later, he came to ask me if I would like to come and be the first woman staff lawyer at the Supreme Court. So I am the first one. Yeah. You, uh, looking over your bio and looking, doing research, you have a lot of firsts in, in your story, which makes sense why you're inducted because you made a huge impact and kind of paved the way. But going back... Well, a if you're 85 bit, years old, you ought to be something. <laughs> right. Uh, going back a little bit... Um, when when was that moment? Why, why did you want to be a lawyer? Like when when is that moment that you think? I mean, I know like you mentioned. I don't this, think I really but, knew it. Yeah. I don't think I know the moment. I just did. You see someone and think that did I, or do, or does it? Do you see someone or does it come down to I want to make an impact? There's there's very few women in this industry. I don't I know. Think I I've get always into liked it. mystery stories, and and I have read that almost every Supreme Court justice or justice on that are women on courts grew up on Nancy Drew you know, the detective story books. And, sure. and I like solving puzzles. The law is solving puzzles. It's like a search. It's okay. like a scavenger hunt almost. Yeah. I, I mean, that's the first time I've ever heard that, but it makes total sense that it, you're right. It is it's scavenger hunt, solving puzzles mm -hmm. and making sure that the outcome is the, the outcome that should happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so when this happens, when, when you, you know, you go through what you just explained and, and your people come to you and say, I think you should do this. I think you should do this. Did you ever think, no, I'd rather go somewhere else? Like, do you ever think what, you know, looking back? Well, what my if mother I didn't think I should be a lawyer. <laughs> no. <laughs> my mother thought that uh, she, she had uh, been to college and had her teaching certificate at 90 hours. But she didn't, she didn't like to teach. Mm. And she really thought that your husband was a failure if he couldn't support you. So she was never as into professional women's work. Now, my daddy always told me that I could do anything I wanted to do and I could do anything and be anything I wanted to be. He was, and my mother would say to him, Johnny, you've got to quit bragging on your daughter so much. And he said, well, if I don't toot their horns, who's going to? So yeah. I didn't realize that everyone didn't have a daddy like that until I was a mature adult, I think. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's special to have a dad like that, mm-hmm. right? And and do you have brothers and sisters growing up? I had a sister. Okay. But she was killed in an airplane crash when she was 17, and I was 20. So oh. I didn't grow up an only child, but I have been all my yeah adult life. Do you so? Do you think that dad was kind of on you and wanted you to be successful because he? And I don't take this the wrong way. You wish he would, might have had his sons, right? Because I and I, the only way I say that is because when you know, like I don't have kids, but I have two girl dogs, and I treat them like boys because it's easier to treat them like boys. But also, I think by treating them like guys, you kind of raise them a different way than coddling and saying you should do this especially in the time that you grew up as well where like you said your mom didn't want you to go to be a lawyer because that might have been seen as disrespectful to a future husband that you were making more money and making it a bigger impact do you ever look at it that way did that i mean does that make sense to you i suppose it makes sense but i looked at it as my daddy just wanted me with him he took me yeah. everywhere from the time i was 18 months old he built a little box on his tractor which oh my god Oh, she would have a fit about <laughs> But he took me everywhere. Yeah. And I never shot a free shot at a tournament. Yeah. Or at a game. But he wasn't standing under the bucket. Yeah. So that total support is, I know it's very unusual, but as far as I'm concerned, he was a saint. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it sure sounds like it. But all, like you just said, leading into your athletics, you know, you were very good at basketball. Uh, does does that start from a, da- a very young age, and then obviously dad gets you into sports from a young age too? No, I uh, we were living in El Reno. Okay. After the war, and then we decided to go back to the farm, mm-hmm. and I was in the sixth grade then, and everyone had been playing basketball. They they knew how to dribble and everything, and I had not a clue because in those days, not every school had women's sports. Mm-hmm. So he had to catch me up today, <laughs> kind of catch me up on it. I, n- I never did uh, learn to dribble very well. I was a long shot artist because look at these arms, see how crooked right. they are. So I, mean, I couldn't control it with one hand. I had to have two. <laughs> yeah. So you found your passion in, in basketball. And, and for those people who don't know that might be younger listening what is a long shot artist because when you were playing there was no three point line correct? No, well it's the three it's the three yeah. point line yeah. yeah so how do you develop uh, just like the ability to think you know I'm actually pretty good at this I'm, I'm great at visualizing it from mm-hmm. a distance and going through that process and, and then people recognize it well I believe in the kiss method and that's the easiest way you know just keep it simple why run around if you can just shoot it and get it in there <laughs> Steph Curry's made a lot of money out of doing that, right? He's now shooting from half court. Uh, was athletics then a big part of, or basketball, a big part of like, oh, your upbringing? Oh, colony, if you didn't, my mother would say, I had, I had to play softball because we couldn't have a team otherwise. There were seven in my class. Mm-hmm. But basketball and church was about what there was going on. And if you didn't play, you were just not worthy that's uh, people listening who are from a small town will totally understand that you're you're in every sport mm-hmm. because they need a team not necessarily because you know it's it's beneficial for you as well but so all right so, so moving forward you mentioned but wait i want to say one other thing about that yeah. i think it's critical for women to play team sports i think that there that you need to know there's a game out there mm-hmm. and you need to know how to play the game and it's not just basketball that you learn to play. You learn that with a team sport, you can't do it by yourself, that we're all in it together. And I think that's really critical. Yeah, the team dynamic and working together and p- playing against opponents who are better than you or worse than you and figuring out how to beat them. And, and it's, it's back to problem solving, right, and working right. together. And that goes into every facet of life, really. Uh, I I love competition. I think it's the greatest thing ever, whether it's golf on your own, tennis on your own, or team sports. I mean, just that competitive nature and drive and knowing how it feels to lose and then why you've lost, I think is a huge benefit as well and a huge lesson. Because if you've lost by playing your heart out and playing very well and the team is just better than you, then you just need to improve. But if you've lost from not putting in enough effort when you clearly should have won, then there's a lot of lessons from that too. And see, it, it, it 
flows over into the court. On Mondays, we go to what I call the Holy of Holies, our conference room, and discuss, no one else comes in there, we discuss among all of us the cases. And I see it as, as a basketball game. I never get my feelings hurt because you suit up. You go in, we don't really suit up. We just, but that's how I see it. You suit up, you're ready to go. You go in, you present your case, you play the best you can, and you win some and you lose some. But you know you're going to get to suit up and play another game. Yeah. So I think it's it's really helpful. Yeah. So going forward then, you obviously, you know, you, know, you, you kind of tracked out for us how you get to where you're at and, and, and just you know, you go to OCU and you're in night school. And why did you go to med tech to, I mean, I, I needed a trade to pay but, for it. But why, why med tech? What are the, well, I sort of was intrigued by that. Okay. I took all the courses that med students do, mm-hmm. but I never wanted to do that human anatomy where you had to work on the cadaver. That just, that, that put me off. Yeah. So you thought, I, I really enjoy this. This is a way for me to pay to go to school. And then you would work nine to five at MedTech and then... At Medical Arts Laboratory. Yeah. After I finished my internship at St. Anthony. And the first day I went to work in my internship at St. Anthony, I met Dr. Rex Kenyon. And he hired me on that day to go to work for Medical Arts Lab a year from then. Mm-hmm. I have never applied for a job except for the Supreme Court. Yeah. That's... Uh... That's a good thing to have, too, right? <laughs> right, and I've never had discrimination. I, yeah. I mean, I'm really, really lucky because being a med tech was a woman's, looked upon, there were a few men in it, but it was mostly a, a woman's job. Yeah. And then Justice Hodges came and asked me to come to work for the court, and now I've been here 50 years. Yeah. And it seems like you love every minute of it. I do love every minute of it. Yeah. So, so when that happens, then obviously you know you you work four hour uh, four years. You're doing night school in the barracks. Okay, that was not the nice Solomon Andrew Layton <laughs> law school. Yeah, but you have a dream and you want to be a lawyer, and mm-hmm. this is what you're willing to do to you know to do it. And and I think it says a lot about you that you went and worked a full time job and then did night school to get to where you're at. There's so much lesson in that as well for people listening that. You know, maybe they're, they're stuck in a job that they don't want to do, but they have opportunity mm-hmm. to do something in the after, you know, after hours that can further their career or do what they really want to do. Um, so when, when, when you get that recommendation that, hey, I think you should come to the courts instead of going into what other law would you think of going into? Well, I did practice law for two and a half years with Senator Cleeter John Rogers, and he came and asked me to go to work for him too. Yeah. And I, Jonna was little. And I said, I can't work full time because I've got to drive carpool. And he he was incredible. Just do the hours you can. Yeah. But when I went to law school, traditionally, they were admitting one or two women to law school classes. And the year that I went to law school, they admitted 11 of us to OCU Knight Law School. And the deans were so proud of themselves that they called us the petticoat class. And when we graduated, the top three men in the class were women. Mm-hmm. What would you attribute your just, you know, you, you mentioned people come to you and have seen you, know, you never really applied for a job, but that obviously comes down to you being significantly good at what you do and top of your class. And that's not just... It seems like it's not, you know, in basketball, it was in other, all the way through your life, you've been very good at yes, stuff. Yes, I was valedictorian of my senior class. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there so, were seven of us in it. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, you didn't have to say that. Uh, but, I mean, what do you attribute that to? And I was co-valedictorian. <laughs> <laughs> Does that come back to dad really just give, telling you you can do anything you want to do mm-hmm. and then just saying, reminding you that it's going to take hard work, but you, the mm-hmm. uh, inner belief from dad? I think so. Yeah. It's that's, that's the one thing that I think, um, you know, people growing up today, you know, they might be graduating law school for themselves now. And, and there's so much doubt out there. There's so much anxiety instead of just people saying, go do it. Like, why, why would you not do that? You know, like kind of get after it. It costs, it costs over a hundred thousand dollars. That is true. It's, uh, when I graduated from law school, I didn't owe any student debt. Mm. And now, it is so expensive. Yeah. 
It's so expensive for my grandson to go to medical school. It's mm -hmm. yeah, totally crazy. Astronomical, right? Mm -hmm. It's not not cheap at all. What? Um, what so. Let's go forward then. What's what's first day like as, you know, hey, I'm going to go be in the courts and, and I mean, you, you have arrived, you graduated, you're a lawyer, you've kind of, you're doing exactly what you want to do. Well, that's when my, my career planner, J.T. Bailey, the lawyer that was down yeah. the hall, said to me, you know, I'm just really proud of you. You're that first woman staff lawyer at the Supreme Court, but you need to be on that court. Yeah. And when Justice Irwin decided to retire from the court and go to work as a magistrate in the federal system. There was an opening in my district. And I applied for it. And one of my friends, who was a judge in the Oklahoma City District Court, the state court, said to me, hey kid, you're not going to get it. And I said, really, Judge, why not? Well, the governor just appointed Alma Wilson two years ago, and he's had his woman. And he was short, and I had on my power shoes, and I was about six feet tall. <laughs> and I just patted him on the shoulder, and I said, don't you worry about it, Judge. Because sometimes the best man for a job is a woe man. Mm -hmm. He came to my swearing in and cried. He was so happy. Yeah, because he thought that, like I said, this is, you know, they've got their, quote, token, the right. image that they want. You mm -hmm. want, you know, the we only need one. Governor and I is very proud that he did two women in a row. And he yeah. came, uh, Justice Rowe, our newest, we call him the baby justice, and he's only 47 years old. <laughs> but he decided on my 50th anniversary of being at the court, which was September 6th, that we should have Governor and I to come and have coffee with the court. And he arranged that, and Governor and I came and, mm -hmm. and was incredible. That man, is his storytelling, it's just amazing. But then they said, uh, does anyone have questions they'd like to ask of Governor and I? And several of the, my colleagues asked questions. And then I said, well, there's a question I've always wanted to ask, and that is, how much did Donna make you do it? <laughs> and he said, I listened to Donna's recommendations, but I, I made the decision. Yeah. He's a special man. A very special man. I sent him flowers on the anniversary of my appointment, March 14th, mm -hmm. every year for 38 years. And Donna says he likes getting those flowers. Yeah. Yeah, he, he was great. I mean, he... Like to your point, he is a great storyteller, mm -hmm. and I think because he's a great storyteller, he probably would have been a great at anything he did. Absolutely. Um, his and he story. writes me thank you notes, and he says he's proud of me, and that means a lot because he really actually gave me my professional career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you you have you've gone on to it, when somebody gives you that opportunity and says, "I think you're the best person for it," they're putting their faith in you, right? And then when you go and perform and you've been here for fifty years and you do exactly what you do, I'm not, you know, there's no doubt that he'd be proud of you because he's, you know, and obviously he's a genuine human being. Like he's, you know, not many people I know still write handwritten notes to people, right? And that's something that in what is he ninety six now? I think like he's. He told great stories on the podcast with us too. He chatted for two hours and then just thought, I'm done, and just got up and left. Uh, but one of my favorites was about him changing the state song, which is mm -hmm. hilarious. Uh, but yeah, that's um, he's a treasure for sure. And uh, an Oklahoma, yeah, he's an Oklahoma treasure. And, and the appointment that I got enabled other people. On Martin Luther King Day one year, I thought, the court is too white. There is no color. Mm -hmm. And so I deliberately went out to search because I had a vacancy for an African a woman, African American woman, secretary. It could have been a man, but it was a woman. And Vanessa was with me 28 years. She just retired two years ago. But that made a, she was a first. She was a trailblazer. And I've always been the the justice that swears in the board at the Historical Society. In fact, I would come over here and tell them I want them to get out of my building, which took 30 years. Yeah, I was going to say, there's a story behind yeah. that, too. <laughs> yeah. 
But Vanessa and I went to Stillwater mm-hmm. to swear in the board of the Oklahoma Historical Society. And Blake Wade was the executive director then. And he looked around the head table and he introduced it and he got to me and he said, well, here's Yvonne, Yvonne's here with us. She's going to, she's going to swear in our new board member. She always does. Then he looked at Vanessa and Vanessa's here with her. Vanessa, why are you here? And Vanessa stood and said, and looked around the room and said, I have come to integrate this group. And she did. Yeah. Because she was the only one, the only face there that was not what. Mm-hmm. I got to tell that story when she was in when when I was inducted to the Historical Society Hall of Fame, and Vanessa came, and I told that story, and I said, "Stand, Vanessa," and she got a standing ovation. So to that point, then with the Oklahoma Historical Society, this was their building, yes, right? Yes, and, and like, I would come over here and swear them in and tell them to get out of it. Yeah. Tell me about that. Tell me about how that process of, of I mean, the beautiful building we look out of at your office is, is you but know. See, I think they downgraded. I really do. This is this. But it was dark and he went in the back door. And yeah. But I, it took me 30 years to get this. I'm a patient person. And, and you, you I, knew it was going to be for you guys. And the, it the, needed. Well, it looks like the Supreme Court. Yeah. Building. And I gave a a speech to the a joint session of the legislature and asked for several things, but I asked for this building. I said, I want the Historical Society to get the building that they need with the proper temperatures and preservation abilities, and I want their building. It should be for the court. Mm-hmm. And Stratton Taylor, who was president pro tem at the time, said to me, you know, Yvonne, normally... You don't ask for somebody else's project. We said, I think this is going to work out. Yeah. So we got the first bond issue, and and Cal Hobson came to see me, who was then, I think, President Pro Tem, and he said, uh, dig your hole. They only gave us $10, $10 million, but he said, dig it. They'll have to finish it. Well, it took three bond issues. Yeah. 30 years and hundreds of dozens of my oatmeal crispy cookies, <laughs> which I took to every meeting of the Appropriations Committee. Yeah. You see, at Colony High School, they, don't, they couldn't get by with this anymore. But they called home economics a science. Instead of having chemistry and biology, I had home economics, although I was a biology major at college. So... I look at it this way. Sometimes there's always good that comes out one way or the other, the yin and the yang. And I got more good out of that oatmeal crispy cookie recipe from my teacher, Helen Brown, than I would have of any science course they might have given me. Because as I told my daughter, this building is built not out of the limestone from Ulithic, Indiana, like the Pentagon and the Waldorf Astoria are, but it is built out of cookie dough. And Bill Settle was the appropriations chair, I think the last one, and I always took those cookies. And I swore him in at the History Center as a member of the board. And I saw him at a wedding of one of my friends and he came rushing over to me. And it wasn't, hi Yvonne, how are you doing, looking good? It was like, are you still making those cookies? (laughs) Can I get the recipe? <laughs> <laughs> so when I swore him in, I did bake cookies and take them to him. And yeah. that's the last thing in the book is the cookie recipe. Yeah. Tell me about the book. Well, Kyle and I started to write the book. Mm-hmm. Kyle's been with me 29 years now. He's never had another job. I, he is invaluable. He is like my son. He's my right and left arms. He's the most talented man I know. Mm-hmm. But it was too much. And uh, Gaylene Rabakuk, who was Justice Winchester's administrative assistant, had just finished her MFA in writing. And I said, Gaylene, would you write the book? And she said she would. And she did. And it's wonderful. Yeah. And we can find the book in 
I'm you can find buy it, it at Full Circle. Okay. Or you could find it at Pirate's Alley. Mm-hmm. Or you can find it here. Okay. I'll put the link to it in the description mm-hmm. for people can go read that mm-hmm. and find out all, all about this incredible building. Mm-hmm. The other thing that you notice when you walk in here is all the artwork that you I have. Know. And it's everywhere and it's fascinating. And the one thing that I didn't tell you earlier was my wife's family is Cheyenne Arapaho as well. Oh, really? And my wife's grandmother was Juanita Learned. I know Juanita Learned. Yeah. Brent. Brent's going. Yeah. In fact, one of the pieces uh, that I bought at Red Earth from Brent, the state of Oklahoma has a, a law that one and a half percent, or it did at the time, mm-hmm. of the cost of the building can be spent on the art. And so I did some shopping at Red Earth and bought this buffalo from Brent. Mm-hmm. And then we had a party for the artists to come and see where their art was. Because Kyle and I hung every piece of art in the building. And... So we go into our really our communication room downstairs, and Brent saw his buffalo. And then two days later, he called and said, Yvonne, my buffalo is very lonely. It's very lonely. <laughs> and so, so he donated two pieces to go with the buffalo. That's awesome. The artists were very generous. Yeah. And, it, I mean, we obviously we only walked uh, just passing out, walking to your office, coming from the front, from the entrance, and... You know, I, I can't wait to take a deeper dive and look around it, but where does the passion for art come from for you? I think from my daddy. Yeah. My first piece of art, he had an AC Blue Eagle in our house burned in Colony, and oh, he was just heart sick over that. So I don't have an AC Blue Eagle in my collection. Yeah. Were you, uh, would he want you to be an artist when you were younger? Do you no, paint or draw no, most? No, no, it was just the, the beauty of it, yeah. and like you appreciated how... It was done, and, and the reasons behind. And, and the good thing was, we have the we have the uh, murals up on the third floor mm-hmm. that are wonderful. They were commissioned by Nan Sheets when she was head of the WPA. And in the '60s, they called her and said, "Nan, you better get down here. They're getting ready to paint over the murals." And so she came, and they said, "What?" She said, "What in the world do you think you're doing?" And they said, "Well, the walls are dirty." And she said, "Well, paint around them." So she not only commissioned them, she saved them. And her house is where Joy Rebelt has her gallery now, mm-hmm. JRB. Okay. This, I, and I've only grown appreciation in the artwork by being married to my mm-hmm. wife and seeing Brent's work and, uh, I mean, Johnny's work and the, the family and her granddad was a wax mm-hmm. artist. And we've recently been collecting some of his stuff uh, and his figures and it's, it's really cool to see it, but obviously for one of the things we did get was we bought a piece and it came with a, a, an authentication letter that was hand signed and dated by a granddad. So she was thrilled of that. Um, but it's not, you know, it, it's such a huge part of the culture too, right? And, and and it means so much to the tribe, but the art is, obviously Harvey's very good at it and you know Harvey well, but there's so many more artists out there that have been kind of given a voice or they give the tribe a voice by their artwork. Well, that's one of the reasons I started my gallery in Colony, because at that time, the Santa Fe market wasn't letting in Oklahoma artists. And it seemed to me that we could do something, and that's the reason for Red Earth, too, mm-hmm. which is a com- was started as a combination of the Colony Powwow and Indian Market in Santa Fe and my little gallery, because I got to know the artists, which has been a blessing. Yeah. So for people who don't know what Red Earth is, then how, do you, how would you explain what Red Earth is and how people can see it and get involved? Well, it's, a little, it's, it's, it's sort of uh, morphed a little bit from where mm-hmm. we actually started. We did have dancing competitions, <clears throat> and the first, the first Red Earth had over 1,100 dancers. They just heard about it and just came. Wow. And the Cheyenne Arapaho... And other the other tribes, but the Cheyenne Arapaho were really most supportive with princesses and cars and pickups decorated for the first first parade. When Allie Reynolds and I, the super chief of the New York Yankees, you may not know about Allie Reynolds. I oh do my not. gosh. No. You don't know about Allie Reynolds. Pitcher for the New York Yankees. Okay. Oklahoma, incredible man. Well, we were dancing in the in the grand entry for the first Red Earth. And uh, 
I said, Allie, this is just wonderful. This is just wonderful. Look, look. And he'd say, he just said, my knees are killing me. <laughs> of all the things he could think of at that <laughs> yeah, time, right, of how killing. amazing this but scene Allie is. Allie stood there <laughs> and paid every winner. He stood there until late in the night to give them their money. Oh, yeah. he, was a, he was an incredible man. So do you, does it happen every year, every two years? It happens every year. Okay. Where at is it every year? Well, they've, they've, we started at what was the Myriad, mm -hmm. and then different things happen, and it gets moved around. And last year it was at the Cowboy Hall of Fame with limited dancing. Yeah. So obviously a huge part of your year is, is being involved in that. And do you have, obviously you're a co-founder, do you have part, like, what, what is your kind of, role during the whole time during the whole festival well as a justice i can't raise money so i can't appear i can't serve on the board but okay. i when they when they do have dances i get introduced as the mother of red earth so that's my part i show up yeah. and dance <laughs> i'm sure uh, i'm sure family's extremely proud of that mm -hmm. too and and just you know back to you being the little girl sat on the bench watching mm -hmm. like it, it's amazing how life comes full circle and how you know when if you look back now you know you've you know 85 years and you think things that things make sense when you're mm -hmm. you know where you are at now compared to you know at the time you're just like i'm just a little girl watching this because it's fascinating to me and now you know through that you've grown a huge passion for artwork and you know competition and you know you followed mm -hmm. your dream to become a lawyer and like you know you have this amazing well, festival too well as i said i was able to do what i wanted to do in the building because of the murals on the third floor mm -hmm. and i was chair of the building committee and when we finished my colleagues thanked me for my work and i thanked them for staying out of my way and letting me do it like i wanted to <laughs> Get out of my kitchen. I'm doing what I'm doing. <laughs> Leave me alone, right? But, but it's a wonderful collection. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It really is a wonderful collection. The piece you saw coming down here, the, the red one, Browning Pipestin said at our first sovereignty symposium, or second, that the tribes used to fight their battles with bows and arrows and spears and on the battlefield. And now they fight their battles in the courtroom. And so that painting is the Briefcase Warrior by Eric Tipiconic mm -hmm. that we commissioned yeah. as a part of Art in Public Places. 65% of the art is from the History Center. Kyle and I went over with Jeff Briley and went through the entire collection. And I knew some of the things were there because Blake Wade had told me earlier, and I'd looked at them. In fact, that was one of the things that I told them, that we had these pieces of fine art that weren't properly stored and, and a reason for the History Center to have their own, mm -hmm. own space. So we went over and looked at them, and it took days, and we would quit when Kyle and Jeff had sweated through their clothes. And then we picked the things that we wanted. And when Governor Fallon came to see this building after it was finished, she loved the art, and I told her that 65% of it was from the History Center. And she said, is there any more of that left over there? And I said, yes, but I took all the good stuff. You have already come through <laughs> all of it. Yeah. Tell me about the, um, tell me about the uh, arts, arts colony that you have and giving back to like your hometown and, and how that's developing as well. Well, I always wanted an art gallery in Santa Fe. Okay. Well, you can't afford an art gallery in Santa Fe. Yeah. And so I came home from, it was sort of like a revelation, like the Apostle Paul that, well, I could have a gallery in Colony, Oklahoma. Yeah. And my grandfather had built Main Street and the post office, which is a very unusual building for Western Oklahoma. It's concrete, but stucco, it looks like Santa Fe. Okay. And so I came back and said to my, to my dad, I want you to give me that, that building. And he said, well, I don't know about that. What are you going to do? I said, I want to do an art gallery. And he said, well, your mother's not in favor of it. And I said, I haven't asked you for anything in my entire life except for you not to go to World War II. And you went because you didn't want people to ask me, where was your, where was your daddy during the war? Yeah. 
and because he was a very patriotic man. But I said, I want this building, and so he gave it to me. And it had crickets in it. The, the Payne Brothers store had been storing sweet feed, and it was just like cricket heaven. And I knew I wanted Archie Black Owl, and that's an Archie Black Owl right there. Archie was one of the children that they rounded up, and he's the grandson of Roman Nose. They rounded up, cut, him, cut their braids off, and sent them to school in Colony and put them in little suits. And Daddy was a town boy, and Archie was down at the school, and mm -hmm. they would march the little school children down to town every once in a while, and Daddy and Archie would throw rocks at each other. And they became best friends all their life. And so I knew I wanted Archie yeah. to be the first artist featured at the gallery. So I wrote him a letter. And then Daddy called me one day, said, you need to get on out here. He said, Archie's here. So I zipped out from Oklahoma City and met Archie. And he said, I got your letter. And that bothered me. And I, I knew I had to get Archie. I didn't know the story about that he was a contemporary of Daddy's. I thought he was much older. And that I needed to get him before he died. He said, it bothered me. And so he said, so I talked to my mother, who <laughs> 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 was like 96. Yeah. And, and she said it was all right. So he was the first featured artist at the gallery, and we did that oh. for 20 years. But now it's hung permanently by with uh, photographs of the first Red Earth and okay. the Colony Pow Wow by Terry Zinn. Do you have, does it, do you have like people coming and going? Oh, from, yes, you know, the, the mayor yeah. of Colony, Lonnie Yearwood, his great-grandfather, is the one that brought the Cheyenne Arapaho yeah. to Colony. Well, he's the mayor, and he is, he's the, the tour guide. So if you come to town, Lonnie will spot you and... Yeah. And, and we will, he will do tours. We have five murals now. That's awesome. Colony is the mural capital of the universe per capita. Yeah. Because we have 125 people and we have five, five murals. murals. <laughs> that's uh, I that's, think Philadelphia has its claims to be the mural capital. Okay. But they have one per 475 people. So we've got them bested by far. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's great art. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the thing with the artwork too is it's it seems to be sweeping across the state. You know, there's a lot of towns that are just you know it's it's gone from the day of the old town being the being you know the Coca Cola mural on the side of the the store, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's now fantastic artwork. And yeah, well, yeah, ours is even more fantastic because there are murals and there are murals. Yeah. And the first mural Patrick Riley did with the kids that's Colony 1882. But it's a, it's a murally mural. But Eric's murals are, of which he's done four, mm. are fine art paintings in an outdoor gallery. They are incredible. Yeah. How, back to this building. How many, how many pieces of artwork do we have hung in the building at the moment? I've never counted them. <laughs> you don't want to count them. That's too many. Yeah. A lot, obviously. But we're and not you, through. We're not through. Yeah. They, there's plenty of wall space, right? Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of having a great building. And, and I think the one thing great about art galleries is is you have enough room to really stand in front of whatever it is you're standing in front of and really take it in under great lighting. And this building has a lot of that. And we have uh, we have an artist every year for the Sovereignty Symposium to do the poster. Mm -hmm. And initially we had to pay someone to do the artwork, and now they volunteer. It's just wonderful. <laughs> so I told you that Eric's doing the next one. He's doing his second piece for us. But Brent called and said, hey, what do you have to do to get to do that artwork for the symposium? And I said, well, you have to volunteer. Well, I want to do it. And I said, great, but you're third in line. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, join the list. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, we've, done, we've done Kenneth Johnson, and I'll yeah. get you guys a T-shirt that he, Kenneth is a jeweler, mm -hmm. a fine jeweler. But three or four years ago, he said, I want to, I want to do that artwork. I'm a, and, and so he's done a turtle that is just incredible. Yeah. And then, it, then Eric said, I want to do that. And then, then I told Brent, you're, you're up next. Looking at, obviously, you know, your, your huge passion and, and dream to be a lawyer and, and then passion for art. Do you, like, does... So a lot of people who work in a stressful job have something that takes them out of it and, and it's a release for them. And it seems like art is a release for you. But also, 
it's a job as well because you love doing it so much and you have a gallery and you have the red earth as well. Now, I used to make people, and I will again. I'll show you one of my people. I, my, my prototype is my grandmother, mm-hmm. but I make it out of clay. Okay. And you talk about stress relief. You pound that cat. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. takes care of it. Yeah. Finishing up. I used then. to be a quilter, too. I've made 10 quilts. Okay. All hand-pieced, all hand-quilted. So you've been pretty creative then, literally, mm-hmm. from, from kind of your I'm one of memories. 33 grandchildren. Wow. Of my grandmother, who came to Oklahoma in 1892 behind a team of oxen, and she died in 1976, I think, having arrived behind a team of oxen and having seen us land on the moon. You, you think about how yeah. that's she lived to, 90, to be 97 and never lost her mind. Her body just finally gave up. But, and you just think about that, that, that so much happened in less than 100 years. And she also wrote a book. And uh, for our grant at Colony, the third grant, we're, we're going to publish uh, my grandmother's book. You know, the, 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 the 86,000 Buddhist sutras say everything is related, everything changes, but everything's related. Mm-hmm. Well, my grandmother ended up at the end of her life living at Colony for a while and four of her children during her lifetime lived at Colony which is sort of weird you know my Aunt Lucille was there as the first she was the first uh, county superintendent in Canadian County and she was the first woman principal in Washita County and then at 65 she's my role model at 65 she retired learned to ride a bicycle, speak Swahili, and serve two terms in the Peace Corps in Kenya and Tanzania. At 65. At 65. And she wasn't through. She got married again. Her husband died. She got married at 85. And that was, I think she, those were the happiest years of her life with George Ryden. Yeah. And then she never quit teaching. As the, as, as the Hispanic immigrants came, she taught them English then the Chinese came, she taught them English, and both these people had restaurants, and when Aunt Lucille would go in, they'd just whoop, you know, oh, Lucille. So that's she, your role she model. lived it to the end. Yeah, I can see why she, was, she is your role model. She, yeah. yeah, that's... The- and, and her, my mother's one of nine children. And I can remember being at a little reunion when Grandma was there and all the other children that were still alive. And all of them, but me, all, everyone there is saying, I can't believe Lucille would go off and leave her 85-year-old mother and go off to Africa when all the rest of them are there within 50 miles. Yeah. I bet that would have been a great experience at 65, going halfway around the world, learning a new language. Mm-hmm. Well, learning to ride a bicycle is a pretty good thing. too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. she loved Africa. I think it was the high point of her life. Yeah. To that point then, well, I mean, what what do you want to do? You, you know, you've been here a long time, and, and like I said, you're I still active. I just want active. to keep on doing it. You want to just keep doing this? As long as I'm at the top of my game, yes. Yeah. Why would I quit to do something that I'd have to search to find something I'd like to do as well? Yeah. What do you enjoy so much about it? Yes. What, yeah, but what, 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 like, what do you enjoy so much about doing this every day? <coughs> Excuse me, one thing, I need the discipline. Okay. I need, I need to get up. I need to get dressed. Getting dressed is the hardest thing. After I've, I've dressed and put on my makeup, my day is made. It's downhill and shady. It's, uh, but, but I love my colleagues. They're my best friends. My staff is like my family. And it's a challenge. It's it's a new case every day. It's there's no, something new. There's always something new. It's solving that puzzle again. Yeah. Going on that that scavenger hunt. Better better than doing crosswords in the paper yes. then. <laughs> right? it, it is. Yeah. And it's better than watching television. But I, I I love to watch television. I watch everything from Ninety Day Fiance. Yeah. <laughs> And I love British murder mysteries. I, I really like those. And I have Acorn and Brit Box and all those things. So I find it highly entertaining. 
Is that what your weekends are most, mostly filled with when you have the time to just sit and no. well, enjoy Well, last TV? weekend was just a, I, I binge watched a couple of things. One of them was Swedish yeah. Backstrom. Another was, was uh, a new one called Sounds. They were both really good. Is that, the does that come titles. from like, to just the want to learn? Keep learning, or just something that you like. I just enjoy watching TV. You know, and you learn something from yeah. everything. I, I I love mystery novels too, and you all, there's always some little tidbit that you learn. Yeah. The rest of it's just I call it garbage, but <laughs> <laughs> passing the time a right. little bit. Yeah. So, uh, I guess looking over your career, and obviously you, you know you're not done. You don't want to be done. Would you change anything? Well, I look, yes, I would probably, ch- I would change it. I thought I would change some things. Okay. Personally. But then you think about it and think, no, no, I wouldn't have John and I wouldn't have my practically perfect grandsons. Mm-hmm. So essentially, no. Yeah. And, and we were chatting before you, you said your, your sons were born in the UK. One grandson. One of them. Grandsons were born in the UK. Yes, Jay was born in the, in the UK at uh, James Radford Hospital in Oxford. He has five names because he was the first child and the first grandchild and the first great-grandchild. Oh, wow. His, his grandmother in England is actually from Holland, and his great-grandmother was uh, spoke only, only German, actually. Mm-hmm. And Dutch. And my mother lived in Colony, Oklahoma, and spoke Oki, but his name is J. Michael Edward for the Dutch part, Colger Scambler. Yeah. And when then Winston came along, they knew they had to give him five names because they're very competitive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he is Winston John Eagle Colger Scambler. Okay. Do you have a name given to you by the tribe? Yes, it's called Living Woman. Hodoma may hit. Okay. And when when was when did that happen? Oh, it was when I was adopted into the tribe. Okay. That's the Standing uh, Bird family and the Hart family were very involved in that. Yeah. And I have a different, you know, I have the Zorro name that. That too. Like we can finish with that because we started with that. That's probably right. a good way to finish. Why why do the the family call you Zorro? John and Bruce were living in England at the time, and emailing is just coming into the, mm-hmm. the fore. And Bruce emailed and said, I have decided, what, we have decided what we're going to call the baby. And I have decided what the grandparents will be called. My mother, of course, will be called Oma, because that's what she would be called in Holland. And uh, the grandfather will be called Opa. And I've decided that you will be called Grandmother Justice. And I said, I don't think so. (laughs) I don't intend to be called anything that sounds like a legal treatise until the baby decides what to call us, and he will decide what to call us. Just call me by my real name, Zorro, which Chief Justice Barnes had given to me saying I was able to cut through those legal issues just like Zorro. And Jonna thought it was funny. And I would say to, they moved back here when Jay was 10 months old, but I would say to him, I'm your grandmommy, you know. And Jonna would say, that's your Zorro. And when he could finally say it, he just looked up at me and said, Oro. So I've been Zorro ever since. That's brilliant. Mm-hmm. That's much better than <laughs> than what they wanted to name you. <laughs> that's, well, it's better than about anything. Right. And J- Jay thought it was uh, a, a synonym for, uh, for, for, for grandmother. He would say to his little friends at St. Luke's, my Zorro is going to pick me up. Is your Zorro going to get you? Yeah. That's awesome. And uh, I'm sure it makes you smile every day when the kids call you Zorro, too. They're practically perfect. They are just wonderful grandchildren. Yeah. Hardy Summers told me, he said, you know, there are grandchildren and there are grandchildren. And you have grandchildren. Yeah, that's special. 
is there uh, is there anything that that you got coming up at the end of the year that you're really excited about that you really would kind of want to tell people about or something that just when people ask you you know is there anything that stands out of what you've done those are two really long different questions mm-hmm. but I'm just trying to think if there's anything well the first that one we haven't is talked about. We were having Thanksgiving in Fort Worth with Winston. Okay. I'm ordering things up from the faculty house because they can really cook and make dressing almost as good as mothers. Mm -hmm. And he is looking forward to that, as are we. Kyle and Walter have helped raise these babies. And Jay and Winston called Kyle, my staff lawyer, and his husband, Walter, the other mothers. Yeah. And Jay said that he loved for Kyle and Walter to come to when he got awards because mother Jay and I, I mean, John and I would stand there and smile and be very happy, and mm-hmm. Colin Walter would cry for him, and that just made him so happy. <laughs> and then I'm being uh, given the Global Ambassador Award by Sister Cities in November. Wow. Congratulations. So? Yeah. That's a pretty big deal. It is. But, but the Hall of Fame is the big one. That's yeah. the big one. I love the quote that's in your bio in the Hall of Fame. Um, the one that says I prepared I prepared many versions of my my biography and that whole paragraph it's about Oklahoma being the promised land and it, it, it's I don't know it, it resonates it's really cool because you know I didn't grow up here and I, I do see that as well and kind of learning the history and, and getting involved and through family now you know understanding the tribal side of things as well well my bio always starts with us with I was born August 3rd, 1937, in Cordell. I never hide it. I don't understand people that want to conceal their birthday. I'm pretty proud of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, uh, I mean, it's the day, right? It's, it's the most important day of the year. For, <laughs> I mean, mine was recently, and it's just a great day to celebrate your birthday. Doesn't matter I don't how old mind, you are. I don't mind it. I don't mind the birthday. I don't like the celebration of it. I don't like no? people to sing happy birthday to me. Why is that? I don't know. I think it must be some childhood memory, but I just know I just sort of cringe when they do it. Yeah. And I'd rather just say happy birthday and go on about it. My daughter celebrates for a month. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're kind of, in my family, we're kind of, we have a lot of September babies, so mine doesn't last very long. Mm-hmm. My wife's birthday is two days later than mine, and then, like, my probably future sister-in-laws is the next day and then their nieces is two days after so I don't really enjoy I get the day and that's it but why Why? Do, yeah it's interesting that you don't like I that. don't know because you're used to being in front of you know you, you have a lot of people around you doing your job and, and everything you do and it's you know in a small pretty you know intimate crowd with family I mean, it's, it's that's, that's really interesting I don't know I appear to be very uh open and gregarious but i think i'm a very private person on the inside maybe yeah you uh do i mean as far as birthday celebrations go do you choose the cake what is the dessert of choice for your birthday kyla always makes me an anderson cake okay Mm -hmm. and then this time we we went to dinner and i was anticipating a new restaurant that would be just like sleepy hollow suffice it to say it was not (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, as I mean, in in the, you mentioned you you know your your the life that your your role model had lived and the things that she's seen growing up. But looking back, you've seen so much too. I right? have. Like you've but seen I'm, the I'm end the of the court's history, you know. Yeah, <laughs> you, you know, you've seen the end of of World War Two, and then you know, like you said, all of this stuff that's happened between thirty seven and now, mm-hmm. in technology changing. Like you mentioned, email coming in, FaceTime, texting. Like it's. I'm sure all of the records have changed from what you've been doing your job. Like that's gotten probably at the time it was not fun to see the change, but now it's a lot easier than it was. Well, Let, for example, a lot less paper. You know, Ken Burns has done the Holocaust mm-hmm. now, and I have not watched it because I felt like I lived it. Yeah. Like Colony, Oklahoma, we had a, a, a theater, which they certainly don't have now. It had dirt floors and wooden benches, but they started off every Saturday with the RKO Path News which they showed these horrible, horrible scenes from the war with the skeletons and the people body stacked and the lampshades made of human skin and the horrors of it all. Uh-huh. And for people to think it didn't exist is just beyond me. 
Yeah, I struggled with people who want to delete history from or take books out of schools and stuff. That's something I did. Yeah, history's history. There's a lot to learn from it. And, you know, we could dive down that rabbit hole and probably lose a lot of people listening. So I don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, last question then. Looking over your life, do you have a favorite decade? This one. This one. The current one. I, I love spending time with my grandchildren. And I would say to people, you can make the memories you want your grandchildren to have. And I took Jay to the quarry, and he got to sign on one of the blocks that's on this building. And I got to tell him, you know, when you're a grandparent, you can bring your children here and say, I, I was there. I went down. I saw what they did. I, helped, I saw them cut the blocks. I signed my name. He also signed his name on the Guardian. And uh, we've just lost Kelly Haney recently, who was an incredible man. Mm -hmm. And the Guardian is placed sort of strangely. The feet are turned and so that it looks like it faces south, but it really faces east because the tribes want it to be east. Mm -hmm. But Kelly came to one of my, several of my New Year's, New Year's Eve parties, and he told everyone that he placed the Guardian so it looked right at my house, which is right across the street. And that's our story, and we're sticking to it. <laughs> well, you get to look at it out of your office every day, which is great. Right from see. my house, so, I live across the street. Yeah, love my commute. Yeah, <laughs> short walk across mm -hmm. the street. Well, we drive. I yeah. drive because we go to lunch every day, and I have to have the company car so we can go to lunch. Yeah. Some days I think I come to work for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Do you throw a big New Year's Eve party? I then? used to. Yeah. COVID. Yeah. That one of your big highlights of the year was having everyone over. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it was six to nine. Oh, really? <laughs> they had to in bed by ten, right. everyone get out of here. Yeah. Why is that? Do you just never stay up for the fireworks at midnight? I just I want them to go home, and they can they can go somewhere else. I don't. Yeah. No, I don't want. I don't stay up till midnight. When I was a little girl, my mother tells that an insurance salesman came, and he wouldn't leave. And in those days, the men wore hats. And I went over and got his hat and presented it to him and said, goodbye. <laughs> and, and he said, well, I guess this little baby knows it's time for me to go. It's time for me to go. 9.30 is about it for yeah. me. But I wake up, see, at 5.30. I'm that farm girl that never goes away, and I would like it, too. Mm. Even on the weekends, it's she's awake. So Yeah. You and my wife would be best friends. She's mm. the same. She's in bed by 8.30. Like, 9 is a push. And even on the weekends. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for sharing so many stories, uh, some personal stories about your role models, everything you've done. Uh, it's of no surprise now after spending an hour with you that you are in, you know, you were inducted last year because you've made a huge impact. And after being here with you, I can just sense how much that meant to you last mm -hmm. year and being a part of that class and, you know, having those people on stage with you. Like it's, it's a huge honor and, I mean, we're reaching 100 years of the Oklahoma mm -hmm. Hall of Fame and just to be a part Absolutely. of that. Absolutely. When we did the gallery at Colony, my daddy was very proud of it, but he would moan and complain as we had to redo the entire thing and the 10 ceilings. And and I said to him, he said, well, why do you want to do that? I said, well, it's going to be worth it, Daddy. This gallery's going to put me in the Oklahoma Hall of Fame someday. <laughs> <laughs> facetious about it but it came true yeah it goes back to just that 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 belief he's instilled in you mm -hmm. that you could do anything you wanted and when you put your mind to it you can do that and clearly mm -hmm. you have a lot of things that prove that through your life and will continue to do that as you know your award that's coming up soon and thanksgiving then with the family too mm -hmm. which is something that you know like i said it's yes we've like, ridden the train down to fort worth yeah which is perfect it is good, yes. We went down perfect. for Winston's birthday. I had T-shirts made, a little stethoscope. Happy yeah. birthday, Winston. And everywhere we went and flashed our T-shirts, he got a $20 gift certificate at the place we had lunch. <laughs> it's a great idea. It was, but it's, it's fun. To, it's, you can go down, leave here about 8.35, mm -hmm. get to Fort Worth around noon, Spend a little time with him and catch the train at 5.30 and be back here by 9.30. Yeah, ready for bedtime. Mm -hmm. 
That's awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for having us. Um, thank you so much for just having, you know, welcoming us into this building that obviously you spent a long time curating, working hard for, uh, and just super special that, you know, your grandson signed the building blocks and that when he is a granddad, he can bring his grandson mm -hmm. down here. Like that's, that's special. And that's just, I know it's like, it's a, that's your legacy, I guess. Right. Like that's something that you leave behind and, and people can come here long after, you know, you're gone, they are gone and still have that, you know, like, this is the impact that, that my great grandmother or great great grandmother had on this state is this entire building. My legacy is my daughter, Jonna, and my practically perfect grandsons, Jay and Winston. Yeah, awesome. Just watch them. I can't wait. I need to meet them now, especially have, because he's named after Winston Churchill, which mm -hmm. is pretty epic uh, but thank you so much I really appreciate it for people listening I'll put the links to the book to the building you can come check it out um, and any and the arts in Colony as well people can go check that out on the little road trip and uh, final congratulations on being inducted last year that's incredible and for people listening we'll catch you next episode cheers Hope you guys enjoyed that great episode. Thank you so much for listening. As always, huge shout out to our sponsors, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, share an Oklahoma story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahomahof.com and follow them on Instagram for daily updates at Oklahoma HOF. Our other sponsor, the Chickasaw Nation, amazing sponsor they do amazing things for the state and they're always sponsoring something in oklahoma they're a huge supporter of oklahoma and without their support we wouldn't be able to do what we do our third sponsor is diffie ford lincoln down in el reno now this one makes me so happy because these guys are great friends of mine um play a lot of golf together i've bought my cars from them do most of my oil changes down there, have a cup of coffee, hang out down in El Reno. It's a good spot to go. And not only are they great friends, but they provide a great service. So for over 60 years, a third generation family owned Oklahoma business down in El Reno. They're also in Bethany as well. So people in the Bethany area know the Diffies really well. But if you're looking for anything new used, um, Ford, Lincoln, or whatever, I'm sure they could find anything you want. Um, check them out, DiffieFord.net, and then on Instagram, at DiffieFordLincoln. Thank you for listening. We are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories. For more great Oklahoma content, follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram. 